I've been investigating a whole class of drugs which are raising concerns in the scientific community. Our story starts with a poisonous lizard. The incretin drugs have proved to be extremely successful and popular, but recently there's been controversy around them. What's going on? Well, I think, um, first of all, they seemed like wonder drugs for diabetes. They did all the right things. They increased insulin secretion. They switched off glucagon, which is the partner of insulin, so they had a beautiful push-pull effect. They slowed down gastric emptying so that uh, stomach contents entered the intestine more slowly, which meant you got a flatter blood glucose curve after, after you'd eaten. And it's, they affect the brain as well, uh, in, including reducing appetite. So just the thing you need for dealing with an overweight person with type 2 diabetes. The analogues such as xenotide and limoglutide and also the DPP4 inhibitors, saxagliptin, citagliptin and so on, are extremely popular. They're, they're worth billions of dollars. But what are the controversies about them specifically? Um, they began with the suggestion that um, these agents could cause pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas, um, and this has been very controversial over the years, but the evidence is steadily building up um, that they do this. Uh, certainly in the safety databases, there's this evidence. Um, so the question is, why do they do that? And it then turned out that they not only affect the islet cells in the pancreas, but they affect the digestive or exocrine part of the pancreas. And they act on the exocrine part of the pancreas as a growth factor. Uh, in other words, the pancreas actually enlarges when exposed to drugs in this class. Uh, enlarging may not in itself be harmful, but the concern is that as the gland grows, the ducts narrow, that causes compression on the acinar cells, which make the enzymes that help us digest. That compression could lead to back pressure, inflammation, and localized or generalized acute pancreatitis. What does GLP-1 actually do in the body? Well, GLP-1 is released from the intestinal L cells into the circulation in, in response to food. And uh, its effects are to stimulate the production of insulin from the pancreatic beta cells in the presence of glucose. A further effect it has is to inhibit the secretion of glucagon from the alpha cell, uh, which is, of course, useful since glucagon... Uh, might otherwise oppose the action of insulin. So it's a kind of push-pull mechanism? Yep, exactly. Uh, that's just right. Uh, and it doesn't end there, because GLP-1 has other effects as well, especially when it's given as a drug, when it's present at pharmacological doses. It delays gastric emptying, uh, which slows glucose entry into the bloodstream after meals, and it also works in the brain on the appetite centres to make you less hungry. GLP-1 itself is a hormone that you can't really use for treatment because it's got an extremely short half-life of about two minutes or so. Its effects were only demonstrated in the first place by giving it as a continuous intravenous infusion. Um, now, the reason GLP-1 has such a short half-life in the circulation, around two minutes, is that it's broken down, about 90% of it is broken down uh, within a few seconds of release. Um, and this is due to the action of a, an enzyme called dipeptidylpeptidase, or DPP4, which is situated in the capillaries draining the L cells en route to the circulation. So one solution to uh, the therapeutic problem was to develop GLP-1 analogues, uh, designer molecules which have the same biological effects as GLP-1 itself, but which um, are designed to be resistant to enzymatic breakdown. Uh, the other way of doing it uh, was actually to inhibit the enzymes, the DPP4 enzymes, uh, allowing the body to boost the action of physiologically secreted GLP-1. GLP-1 is a naturally occurring hormone in the body, so how is this little healer monster over here, how is he involved? Well, the healer monster is a, a fascinating and rather unpleasant little creature. Um, it so happens that, as we mentioned a moment ago, GLP-1 is naturally broken down by the body almost as soon as it's produced. So it has a very short half-life, which means it can't be used effectively as a treatment. So people looked for analogues of GLP-1, similar hormones, similar biological action, but not broken down in the body. 
Now, it so happens, and this is where the interest begins, that the perfect chemical was found in the saliva of this poisonous lizard. Uh, the question is, what's uh, a drug that we're actually injecting into hundreds of thousands of people doing in the saliva of a poisonous lizard? And the answer is a very interesting one. The uh, Gila monster is one of very few poisonous lizards in the world. It lives in the Sonoran Desert in the north of Mexico, uh, and it lies doing nothing like this for most of its existence. And it eats very intermittently. There may be gaps of weeks or months even between meals. And it turns out that the GLP-1 that it produces in its saliva has a particular fascinating purpose. And that is that when it's not eating, it switches off its gut. It shrinks its pancreas, it doesn't make digestive juices, the small bowel uh, re reduces itself to a quiescent state. But when it eats, it suddenly needs to have its digestive apparatus, and that's where the GLP-1 comes in. The GLP-1 that it produces in its saliva, but also in its bloodstream, serves the function of making the intestine, the intestine and the pancreas grow very rapidly. In fact, the pancreas enlarges by about 50%. So it's very odd that uh, what we use as a therapeutic drug uh, to deal with metabolism is actually used by the Gila monster to produce growth of the pancreas. And that's a bit of a hint as to one of its unwanted side effects as a drug. So we know the analogues are exenatide and liraglutide, and there's another class of drugs, the DPP4 inhibitors, and they're saxagliptin, citagliptin, um, linagliptin, and so on, known as the glyptins. What are the concerns about their safety? Well, these are so-called pleiotropic drugs. A pleiotropic drug is one that hits multiple targets at the same time. Instead of being a magic bullet, which ideally hits one malfunctioning body system and sets it straight, these are magic shotguns. They hit a lot of tissues all at the same time. And GLP-1 is a multifunctional hormone. It has useful metabolic purposes uh, associated with the way we handle meals, uh, which you've heard about producing insulin, uh, slowing the gut and, and, and so forth. But there are GLP-1 receptors on other tissues. Um, particularly, there are GLP-1 receptors, for present purposes, on the exocrine or digestive part of the pancreas. So the effect of the GLP-1 interacting with the exocrine pancreas is to make it grow just as it does in the Gila monster. Uh, in fact, recent data from humans suggest that there may be, on average, about a 50% enlargement of the exocrine pancreas in humans receiving this drug. Uh, does that matter? Well, the answer is we don't really know. Uh, the concern is that if Although acute pancreatitis affecting the whole pancreas appears to be unusual, the concern is that a much higher proportion of people could be getting subclinical pancreatitis. And one hint of that is that pancreatic enzymes tend to rise below the critical level, but they nonetheless rise consistently on all the incretin-based therapies. The exact mechanism of what's causing pancreatitis is a bit controversial. But can you delve into what might be going on, starting with the pancreas itself? Well, it's got two main functions. The first is endocrine. The islets produce pancreatic hormones, of which the most important are insulin and glucagon. Uh, the digestive or exocrine part of the pancreas produces digestive juices, alkalis, uh, digestive enzymes, which mix with food in the intestine to aid digestion. When the acinous cells are functioning normally, they release digestive juices and enzymes uh, these go into the lumens of the small ducts and then converge upon the larger ducts and finally reach the duodenum at the ampulla of Vata. New duct cells are formed from stem cells, probably located in the pancreatic duct glands. The new cells are sought to move from there into the wall of the pancreatic ducts and acini and form the functioning cells. One possibility is that increased proliferation of duct cells could cause partial or complete blockage of the smallest ducts. In fact, the PDGs, where these duct cells originate, are well supplied with GLP-1 receptors. And the interaction of the GLP-1-based therapies with these receptors seems to offer a plausible model for the observed proliferative effects of these agents. 
Now, obstruction of a pancreatic duct is a very well-established cause of pancreatitis. Uh, for example, when a gallstone impacts in the ampulla of vata. Increased back pressure is associated with premature activation and intracellular release of stored digestive enzymes, with resulting localised cell death and inflammation. So, one possibility is that increase in therapy might be causing low-grade inflammation within the pancreas. Unfortunately, this is very hard to either to prove or to disprove, since it's not practical to take a biopsy to see what's going on in the pancreas. But there is one clue, and that is that levels of the two pancreatic enzymes, the ones used to diagnose acute pancreatitis, amylase and lipase, show greater subclinical elevations in people on the incretins than on other diabetes therapies, although no one really knows how to interpret this. The concern doesn't end there, however, since accelerated turnover of duct cells is associated with growth abnormalities known as ductal metaplasia. Metaplasia is a potentially pre-malignant change which may progress to overt malignancy via the formation of pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia or panin lesions. Panin lesions are now very well characterized and they show progressive morphological changes which develop in parallel with a cascade of somatic mutations. Panin lesions are relatively common. Uh, they're present, for example, in about 50% of pancreases in the aging human population. And they're even more common in the presence of chronic pancreatitis. Cells in these lesions express the GLP-1 receptor. So there's therefore the potential for these cancer seeds to progress further in the face of incretin-based therapies. Indeed, signals for pancreatic cancer have been noted in the FDA database with respect to both the GLP-1 agonists and the DPP-4 inhibitors. So this potential hazard may be theoretical, but it does require further investigation. So manufacturers are saying, look, we've done these big studies, these big database studies, and there's no increased risk of pancreatitis, let alone any increased risk of pancreatic cancer. What's your response to that? Well, you have to take that in several stages. There, the, the basic biology is undeniable. Uh, it's undeniable that in certain uh, animal models, and apparently also in humans, the pancreas enlarges in response to these treatments. It's undeniable that um, there are small rises in pancreatic enzymes. Now, no one knows if these are harmful, but they would be consistent with the concept of uh, subclinical pancreatic inflammation. So that's really not in dispute. What is in dispute is whether you're getting a signal for acute pancreatitis in the human studies. Now, there were in fact signals in some of the early studies um, which caused an alarm and there were also clinical reports which meant that very early in the development of these drugs, all of them, all of these drugs in regular use have got regulatory warnings for acute pancreatitis. In fact, the numbers have enlarged astronomically in recent years. Uh, there are thousands of reports of pancreatitis with these agents largely reflecting the extent to which they have been used. The companies are saying, well, we're not seeing it in our studies. Um, and so we've got what seems to be a genuine paradox that in the studies they're doing, formally, properly controlled, they're not seeing many episodes of pancreatitis, but they are, whereas the safety database are saying that there is pancreatitis out there. And the probable reason is that you're getting an increase in pancreatitis, but not uh, an enormous risk in a, increase in risk for acute pancreatitis. So that's probably not the major issue. The major issue is what's going on in the rest of the population. So that, there's been a signal for, for pancreatic cancer. Again, the companies deny this, but is that consistent with what we have seen so far? We know about the biology. Yes, it's an absolute, um, uh, follows in se logical sequence because just about every form of human pancreatitis, acute and subclinical, is associated with an increased risk of cancer. Um, so that if there is indeed subclinical pancreatitis going on in humans, there should, according to the standard uh, dogma, be an increased risk in pancreatic cancer. And what is of particular concern is that a signal has emerged, uh, certainly on the FDA database, 
It's been examined many ways round by different independent people doing their analyses. The signal is still there. It could be chance, uh, but I think the companies aren't in a position to say that it doesn't happen, uh, and we must therefore look very closely at this potential risk, because pancreatic cancer is a cancer that no one wants to get. So a recent study done by UCLA and the University of Florida analysed eight human pancreases, seven on citagliptin, one on exenatide, and they found that the pancreas is enlarged by 40%, and they'd also found hypercellularity in the islets, both beta cells and, perhaps more concerningly, of the alpha cells. Also, an increased number of those cells stain for both insulin and glucagon, which is normally only seen in fetal life. A further feature was the formation of strings of glucagon staining cells. These sometimes extended into the pancreatic ducts and so have the potential to cause obstruction of the lumen. What's more, Three of the pancreases showed alpha cell microadenomata and one showed a frank neuroendocrine tumour, all remarkably unusual changes. Now is this something that, that we should anticipate or could have been anticipated in your view? Well I think it took people by surprise but when you go back and look in the literature, the findings from UCLA and the University of Florida um, actually are not entirely unexpected because one of the actions of GLP-1 is to suppress glucagon secretion. And certainly in knockout models which lack the glucagon receptor, you see changes amazingly like the changes you've reported in these human pancreases. You see uh, expansion of the exocrine pancreas, which was a feature. You also see uh, expansion of the islets. You see formation of new but apparently immature uh, endocrine cells which uh, stain both for insulin and for glucagon and in some cases for both. A precedent exists for that because that is closely similar to some of the experimental models suppressing glucagon. The companies argue and those that are arguing on behalf of the companies that um, glucagon isn't totally suppressed and the knockout mice are not a good model, it's different with GLP-1. So they say that there's no evidence that GLP-1 has that effect on alpha cells. So I just only emphasise that what matters is, happens, is what happens to humans and that what happens to humans is strikingly like what has happened in mouse models. Agreed in the mouse models they knocked out the glucagon receptor and I think much less is known about the effects of partial suppression of glucagon. But it's interesting that, uh, for example, in 2006, uh, Dr. Drucker pointed out specifically that reduced uh, glucagon, as uh, achieved by, for example, exenatide, had the theoretical risk of alpha cell hyperplasia. So at least the, hyper the hypothetical risk has, was, uh, 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 people were aware of that risk uh, from the time when exenatide first went on the market. So where does this leave us? What's the take-home message for doctors prescribing the drugs and patients taking them? Well, I think that doctors who prescribe drugs and patients who take drugs should be aware that there are concerns. Uh, having said that, uh, what we have discussed so far raises substance for concern, but not for alarm. There are important questions that need to be sorted out. There's every reason to believe that if these changes are taking place, they will be reversible. Uh, but we can't let too much water pass under the bridge. We need to act now. So given what we've just discussed and what we've heard about this little Gila monster here, what we really need is an acknowledgement there is a concern so we can have a frank discussion about the potential risks of this class of drugs.